In the work we do in our communities, we have found that there's an interest in learning more about other health-related organizations that are connected to rural Alberta. We thought by hosting these organizations via Zoom, we could get some information out there to those of you that are interested. Today, we are thrilled to have Dr. Richard Luenchuk, who is the Senior Medical Director of Health Systems Integration, Alberta Health Services, and Isabel Henderson, Executive Director, Director, Special Projects, Alberta Health Services. They're both here to help us learn more about how engaged, vibrant communities are attractive to healthcare professionals and support holistic care. With that, I will turn things over to Dr. Luanchuk and Isabel. Thanks very much, uh, Holly, uh, for that very uh, generous introduction. And uh, I'm Isabel, and I'm going to start. And um, Richard's going to drive... I- we were having some challenges, or I was, with our technology this morning. So um, anyway, Richard's going to drive. So it's just our pleasure to be here to talk with so many people today uh, about um, communities as creators of health. So the work that we do in health system integration is um, uh, to help our, our, <laughs> our sort of focus is to help Albertans to be as healthy and independent as they can in their homes and communities. So we focus on working collaboratively with multiple partners, um, would include folks from the health system, from social services, community-based partners, third uh, third sector partners. um, And we are focused on transforming services using asset-based approaches and co-production. And the aim of health system integration is to promote health and wellness with a view to reducing illness and the need for illness uh, and the need for illness care. In Costa Rica, um, and I don't know if any of you have had the opportunity to watch the Netflix series the, called The Blue Zones, but there's a whole episode on Costa Rica. So I you know, really recommend you to have a, a peek at that uh, documentary series. So you hear the the phrase, health is a form of wellness created by community. So what we traditionally think of as the healthcare system is in fact largely the illness care system. Uh, This is a saying, a quote from Cormac Russell, and many of you are probably aware of the work that he and uh, John McKnight do in asset-based community development. But he says that if you focus on sickness, you're going to end up with doctors as the key actors. However, if you focus on well-being, you're going to end up with communities as the key actors. So I will hand it over to Richard. Thanks very much, Isabel, and thanks to everyone for uh, extending this invitation to be with you this morning. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit of a a story very very briefly, but uh, I think it'll be a little bit eye-opening for us. And so if you go back a few years into the early 2010s, 2015, you may recall that Alberta had the most expensive healthcare system in Canada. So we spent more per capita on healthcare than anyone else. So in 2015, the question arose, you know, why is our healthcare system so expensive? And so the data people went to the data and they actually came up with the answer that it's because we put more people in a hospital than any other province in the country. And so half of our Alberta tax dollars are spent on healthcare and half of those dollars are spent directly on hospitals. So hospitals are the biggest line item in healthcare costs. So the uh, pundit said, okay, well, that's fine. We're, why are you, we're putting more people in a hospital. Who is it that's ending up in hospital? And it turns out that it's actually older people with multiple chronic conditions or frail elderly who uh, com- uh, comprise the actually the vast majority of hospital bed days. And so then the question was asked, well, why, you know, why them? What are the reasons that they're ending up in hospital? And so this is where healthcare systems around the world make a fatal error. And this is, uh, we, we went down this path as well. And so when you ask the health data people, why do people end up in hospital? What happens is that they give you a list of diseases, heart failure and kidney disease and diabetes and so on. And so we hire more cardiologists, set up more heart failure clinics, and absolutely nothing changes. 
But what we did was we did something differently. We actually went to the hospitals around the province, to the largest and to the smallest hospitals, and literally said, you know, why are these people in hospital? Why is that person in hospital? And what we heard time and time again was the following. And that was, well, you know, medically, maybe this person doesn't really need to be in hospital, but, and we'd say, well, but what? They'd say, well, but I couldn't send them home, but I knew if I sent them home, they'd be right back. Uh, I know they weren't managing at home. What we were really hearing was that the resources needed to keep people at home actually didn't exist, weren't known, or weren't coordinated. And the surprise to this is actually much more we don't know about them and they aren't coordinated, then they don't exist. Yep. For example, for our colleagues in FCSS, there are 26,200 not-for-profit volunteer and charitable organizations in Alberta. So we have lots of resorts uh, just in that realm uh, as well. Places like England have 86,000 volunteer organizations. So there, there's plenty of resource um, available. It's how can we use it uh, better uh, together. So going back then, we said, okay, well, if we could predict who's going to end up in a hospital, then maybe we could intervene and prevent them from having to require hospitalization. So the administrators would use different words. They'd say, well, if we can keep them out of hospital, we'll save money. To which we always say, if your goal of healthcare is to save money, then you can do it easily within minutes. Just lock the doors to the hospital, stop sending ambulances out to bring people to the hospital, stop doing knee replacement surgery, stop treating cancer. That's your goal to save money. That's all you have to do. So clearly, again, that's not our goal. Our goal is to look after people. So if we could predict hospitalization, then maybe we could intervene early. So again, we took the data, put it into the computer, and these days, artificial intelligence is all the rage and machine learning. And we did that back in 2015, 2016. And we said, okay, can we predict who's gonna end up in a hospital? And despite the use of all of that, these fancy techniques, we came up with nothing. We could not predict who was going to end up in hospital. On the other hand, we know that the average family doctor has a pretty good idea who of their patients is going to end up in the hospital in the next year. Any nurse can pretty much predict who's going to end up in a hospital in the next year. And in fact, meals on wheels drivers can predict with over 90% accuracy who of their clients is likely to end up in a hospital in the next year. So what was the missing link? Well, it turns out that, I forgot to tell you one key point, is that we couldn't predict who's going to end up in a hospital using medical administrative data. But we had the opportunity to access data on seniors, social data on seniors living in Edmonton from the city of Edmonton. And we matched that data or merged that data with the medical data. And lo and behold, all became clear we had a very good idea and a fairly good ability to predict who was going to end up in a hospital. And so there are actually a number of predictive factors about who would end up in a hospital. But if you could only choose one, if you were forced to choose just one measure that best predicted hospitalization in seniors in Alberta, this is it. It was their loneliness score. The greater the loneliness score, the greater the socialization, or, um, the lack of, of social connection, the greater the likelihood of ending up in hospital or being hospitalized. Or, and, or because hospitalization is the greatest health expenditure, that was the greatest driver of healthcare costs. It wasn't diseases, it was loneliness. So let me ask you this rhetorical question because we're going to come back to it later. Is it the role of Alberta Health Services, Alberta Health and hospitals and doctors to be dealing and treating the loneliness? Should we hire a whole bunch of people to go visit people uh, to treat loneliness or are there other options? We'll come back to that. I'll hand things back over to Isabel. 
Okay, well, I know that we're preaching to the converted here in terms of social determinants of health. So they're, you know, we know they're critical because they highlight the non-medical factors that impact individuals' well-being. Uh, factors like socioeconomic status, education, house, housing, access to resources, you know, these can all influence health outcomes. So addressing these uh, determinants is essential to improving uh, and promoting health equity and improving overall public health. So when you look at your community, you know, um, in terms of health, you know, we need to focus on stable housing, food security, education, social connections, uh, drawing on Richard's comment on loneliness, transportation, access to recreation, and so on. And most of these are actually determined at a local community level. Uh, stands to reason then that most health and wellness is created outside the formal health care system. So medical care um, as a determinant of health is insufficient for really ensuring better health outcomes. And it's estimated that medical care is, is only estimated to account for 10 to 20 percent of the modifiable, modifiable contributors to health outcomes, healthy outcomes for a population. And research shows that 80 percent of the modifiable factors which determine uh, health lie outside the traditional healthcare system, i.e. in the community. And this is a quote that you probably have heard before from uh, Dr. Michael or Sir Michael Marmot um, in his book, The Health Gap, the challenge of an unequal world that most of us cherish the, cherish the notion of free choice, but our choices are constrained by the conditions in which we are born, grow, live, work, and age. So we have conditions such as social connections, again, drawing from that loneliness piece, education, super important, income and employment, and childhood experiences, to name a few. Municipal or community level, low cost actions can actually create and help maintain health. I'm going to now pass it over to Richard. As Isabel mentioned, you know, our, our communities are actually creators of health. So you in your communities, you know what your strengths are, you know what your assets are, and you're in the best position to determine your needs. Um, and so it's it's actually you telling us in the formal healthcare system what it is you really need. One of the things that we do know is that people that live in vibrant, engaged communities um, around the province, you know, where there's a lot of things going on, a lot of community cohesion, sort of what we you know talk about when we think about uh, Alberta and what we like to be proud of. Um, Healthcare professionals are people too. So they're attracted to communities like that. We sometimes get asked, you know, how can we recruit, you know, a physician to our community? Well, if, you know, if there's no recreation opportunities, you know, extracurricular educational activities are limited, you know, so on and so forth, not very attractive to healthcare professions versus having vibrant communities. And that's something that the community itself uh, uh, creates. And, and we'll, we'll come to that uh, in a moment. So historically, and, and this just isn't, this is around the world, the, the healthcare system sort of functions, started off functioning, well, we know what's good for you, we're going to do this to you. Uh, and then maybe a little right. bit of maturing to saying, okay, well, instead of doing it to you, we'll do it for you. As you know, that paternalistic, we know what's good for you. But nowadays, we're much more into, okay, we won't be doing this for you, we'll do this with you. But the ultimate state of maturity is actually it's, you know what's best for you. So you tell us what you need, you're in charge, and we will help you. So going back, for example, to our loneliness uh, example. So loneliness just isn't an issue in Alberta. It's global. Uh, you probably see a lot of it in the, in the media. So it's not limited to any country, it occurs in rural, it occurs in urban, it, it's a global uh, problem. So how then, you know, do we address loneliness, you know, and I would suggest it's not the role of Alberta Health Services to be creating teams of people going out to address loneliness, but it's something that we can easily do at a community level. The other thing that has been found 
uh, is that if you live in a community, a vibrant community, connected community, you know, our stereotypical one where everybody knows everyone else in a good way, helps out, pitches in, you know, has a lot of community activities, that type of a community, not only you know, we can sort of intrinsically understand that that will have benefits in our mental and emotional health, but it actually has direct benefit on our physical health as well. And so again, even more than that, you know, we in the healthcare system, you know, often, you know, we think in terms of hospitalizations and emergency room visits and length of stays in hospital and, and illness, but communities like this as well, it's not just health benefits, but things like crime rates go down, uh, addiction rates to various substances go down, unemployment goes down, uh, school dropout rates go down, all sorts of benefits uh, to the community. I like to tell the story about uh, in East Central Calgary, uh, sort of the inner city, where there was a program to provide free dental care to the residents. Uh, after they, for a while, they sort of looked at the effects of providing free dental care. And I was asked people, well, what do you think happened as a result of providing free dental care? And people say, okay, well, you're from the medical system. Hmm, must have been fewer emergency room visits. And the comment is, well, I'm, I'm not really sure but the crime rate went down 50%. So everything is linked to everything else. And it's when we do things from a medical perspective or the medical intention in mind, often it has other beneficial spin-offs and vice versa as well. So let's go back to the loneliness. You know, how th this is a rhetorical question. So how could your community address loneliness amongst its citizens? So I'm sure you can come up with all sorts of different ways of doing it. Uh, I'll cite I'll, uh, Smoky Lake uh, in Alberta, northeastern Alberta. And when they learned about the importance of loneliness and the impact of loneliness, they said, well, that's something we can do. Our community can do that. You know, we've got a room in the in the town hall. So every Tuesday afternoon, we're going to have tea for, you know, the seniors or people who might be experiencing loneliness. So they started doing that. And then they said, well, this is pretty good. It's good socialization, why just Tuesday afternoon? Well, let's expand it you know, to, to more than just Tuesday afternoons. And so they did that. And then they thought uh, some more and they said, you know what, this is good for the people that know about it and have transportation. What about people who don't know it or who are out in the farm and can't uh, get in? Well, let's find out who they are and bring them in. So they did that. And then they said, okay, well, we've been sitting around here and we've been drinking tea, but we should do something, you know, what, what and, and what do we do well? And if you know Smoky Lake, it's right in smack in the middle of Ukrainian ethnic farming communities. And they said, we're Ukrainian. We make food. So they started making Ukrainian food for the local lodge and so on and so forth. So it just grows and grows. And we see this over and over and over again as communities start in just one simple area. Uh, it grows from there. Social connectedness and building that sense of community as well is really, really critical. It's, it's sort of, it is that, you know, cliche white picket fence, 1950 sort of, of vision, but it actually is true and it does work. So, you know, question arises, how can your community create cohesiveness and encourage community support and participation? Well, you know, in the olden days when barns were built by hand, there was, you know, the barn raising, but participating in community work projects, I know, Two communities, one built a swimming pool, one built a recreation center. And they went to the citizens, uh, the businesses, the government, everybody pitched in to create these. And it created that sense of community. And at the end of it, they had a swimming pool and the other community had a rec center benefiting the community and surrounding areas as well. Supporting volunteering and participation in social causes or just creating those recreational opportunities uh, as well in the big cities. Edmonton and now Calgary and other places, Red Deer support community action. They're trying to turn the cities into a collection of little villages. So they encourage things like block parties, but community events are critically important for developing that sense of community, which then has an impact on our health and wellness. Finances even, you know, play a role uh, as, uh, as well. Um, we, talk about financial strain that has an impact on health. And we as physicians have learned that both at the primary care level and even at the specialist level, where we don't really realize it, 
people don't tell us that, gee, I'm, you know, I can't afford the medications because people are embarrassed uh, to, to admit that. And so we try and treat the diabetes with pill number one, it doesn't work. We add pill number two and pill number three, and it's still not under control. And what we didn't realize is that people couldn't even afford pill number one. So it sends us down the wrong path. And we've seen that, as I say, over and over again, as we understand the importance or people unable to eat, to eat period or eat in a healthy manner an impact on their health. So as we understand the importance of these social determinants, uh, addressing things like financial strain, which can then facilitate adequate housing and adequate food uh, supply um, is important. So from a community perspective, then, you know, what can the community do to help support financial wellness as well as resilience within communities, people experiencing stresses and traumas? Well, it sort of goes, you know, the financial wellness, you know, things simple as buy local, so, you know, rather than jumping in the vehicle and driving in an hour to the Costco or to the, you know, the big superstore, you know, maybe think of supporting local businesses uh, as well as a mechanism of promoting financial wellness, hiring local, um, those sorts of things. I'm sure people can come up with all sorts of ideas. The other thing around resilience is, so resilience is sort of the ability to cope with, uh, with stressors and to deal with them. Um, sometimes we use resilience in the wrong way. In the healthcare system, we often talk about resilience, which often translates as, you know, put up and shut up, uh, but that's not it. It really means is, you know, how can we keep going despite all the stuff life throws at it? And one of the most important ways is actually through community supports, through neighborliness and community. And again, how can people do this? Um, so I'm just going to, talk about uh, this uh, for a moment. Um, and this is sort of the brain story. So one of the things that we know is that a lot of illness or unwellness starts way upstream in childhood and early in childhood, in fact. So we know that children that grow up subject to various toxic stresses, things like family violence or financial strain or in an abusive household, it actually has physical effects on the brain and the whole physiology and sets up these children in later life for challenges with mental health, emotional health, but also physical health as well. Uh, the body doesn't differentiate between mental stress, emotional stress, or physical stress. It is all the same for the body. So the body starts this low level. It ramps up the immune system to, a, to, to face this stress. And in doing so, it creates this low level of inflammation. It changes the hormones being secreted. It changes the brain neurochemicals. And all of this does things like leading to obesity, which then leads to type 2 diabetes, the second most costly uh, chronic disease in Alberta. It affects the blood vessels that thickens the blood vessels, leading to high blood pressure, the most costly chronic disease in Alberta, leads to depression, the third most common and costly chronic disease in Alberta, all of which goes way upstream to childhood. We did a study in Black Gold School District, south of Edmonton, uh, following children for about seven years. And by the end of the study, we were able to predict at age five, if a child would develop type two diabetes, and not only that, at what age they would develop type two diabetes. So our programs now are intervening you know, with 50 year olds and we're gonna have exercise and walking pathways, which are all very good. Um, no problem with that at all, but we got to think way upstream with children. The other point uh, around resilience is that all of the, if you look at the bottom left panel with these red boxes and with these uh, green boxes and this uh, teeter-totter here, you know, life throws all sorts of bad things at us, those and stresses. That's the, the red boxes representing this teeter-totter. But one of the things that can mitigate all of these bad things are all the green boxes, all of the social supports that we have, belonging to a community, to a church, synagogue, temple, mosque, um, neighbors, all of these mitigate our, and uh, are counter to the stresses that we experience. 
this purple fulcrum in the middle sort of also represents a person's intrinsic ability to deal with these stresses. So ways in which we can help people and enable them uh, to deal with this. And here's an example of how it was done in communities in Alberta through a program called RIFS of reducing the impact of financial strain. So this was in a number of rural communities in Alberta. And what they did was they went to the communities and said, what is your greatest needs? So remember that four boxes of to you, for you, with you, or you do it, tell us what's important. And the communities said, what we're really missing is we're missing mental health supports, but just mental health supports in terms of being able to cope with anxiety uh, and stress. And so anxiety and stress, you know, the we on the medical side can say, well, you know, we're, we're not great counselors, but we can refer you to a psychologist and people say, yeah, and that's $200 an hour. Plus there is no psychologist in our town. And then we would think, and well, you know, that's not really the realm of psychiatry. So, you know, we don't know what to do, but the community said, we know what to do. And what they literally did in these communities, they set up things like, you know, coffee or tea clubs and people experiencing particular types of stress. For example, there was one for single mothers. And literally they got together, talked, it was peer support and their intrinsic abilities to deal with these stresses improved as well. So simple things that communities can do. So uh, in Alberta Family Wellness uh, initially, they say, you know, things that we can do to remove the stresses, remove the red boxes, or increase the supports, the green boxes, have huge benefit. And one of the things that we know is even for children growing up in with family stresses and with various stresses, the community can mitigate uh, a lot uh, of these. So I'll hand things back uh, over to Isabel. Okay. Thank you very, thank you very much, Richard. So um, just, you know, I think it's, uh, it's self-evident that, you know, uh, you know, making investments early in a child's life uh, reaps huge benefits in the long term. So for every dollar spent on early childhood, uh, early child development, you save $7 over the life course because children with better uh, child development are less likely to end up delinquent, be involved in criminal activities, be unemployed, etc., so saying that we can't afford to invest in early child development means that we're really storing up bigger costs in the future, just deferring uh, those costs. So I think, you know, from what we've been talking about so far, I think you're getting the picture about how important it is, uh, the role that the community actually plays in developing and impacting health and wellness. So 90% of activities and initiatives at a municipal community level have a direct or indirect uh, impact on the, social, on the social determinants of health. So we can say when you do the math that over 70% of our health is actually determined at a municipal, municipality level. So, I mean, the power is at the municipal level for sure in this equation. So when you look at community, we talked about, you know, the importance of, of um of co-production um, of health with communities. So that, you know, involves collaboration with healthcare professionals and community members to design and implement and evaluate health um, intervention. And it really uh, values the community's expertise and actively involves them in, in decision-making. So when you look at all of the various aspects that are really important to community, uh, connecting communities, um, connecting people with one another. And there are very different outcomes that are key for each of these sectors. So from the, the person um, perspective, the family caregiver, they would have a, a different outcome that would be important to them. The healthcare system, we hear lots about the, out, the outcomes that are important to healthcare, the healthcare system, you know, reduced emergency wait times, um, you know, reduced um, ALC days, uh, et cetera. Uh, PCNs also have outcomes that are important to them, volunteer sector, FCFS, uh, citizens, businesses. So it, I think it's very important when we look at, at health, it's really key that we identify what is, what is important for each of these components in our communities. Many of you have probably heard of social prescribing. It's become very um, sort of um, uh, well, well known in the literature in the last 10 years or so, and particularly in the last couple of years. And it's, it's really a healthcare approach that 
involves connecting people or clients, patients, whatever, with non-medical sources of support in their communities to improve their overall well-being. So instead of relying solely on traditional medical treatments like you know medication or whatever, healthcare providers may actually uh, prescribe activities such as physical exercise, art classes, community volunteering, or other social engagements. So this, uh, again, builds on the, our, our discussion today that the impacts of social, economic, and environmental factors on health, and it aims to address them by integrating community resources into the, the patient's care plan. So it's, it's, it's really recognizing that these are critical. So um, in terms of the um, Healthy Aging Alberta Initiative, which is happening in many uh, communities across the province, and we have some of the partners listed below, um, and some of the, the outcomes that they're seeing from social prescribing for, for older adults and focusing more on the dementia population, improve physical and mental health, increase confidence to live at home, so less pressures on the traditional healthcare system, reduce loneliness and isolation, again, that theme of loneliness, uh, reduce length of stay and frequency of hospital stays. And uh, I think really important is the increased uh, community connections and the natural support net networks that exist in our communities. So healthy communities not only prevent problems from arising, but they actually create the conditions for flourishing and resilience within communities. They invest in a foundation of networks, relationships among people that enables us to lead better lives. So in the end, a healthcare system is just people looking after people. Sounds a bit Pollyanna, but actually there's so much evidence to, to prove this. And we have on the next slide just some resources, and we will share these slides um, with the group, just some resources that you might be interested in checking out. And uh, finally, we'd like to thank you, and we'll open it up for questions. In the study, did they talk about the impacts of weather, winter months, cleaning of sidewalks, driveways, parking lots, and how this imp impacts people's abilities to get around and meet others? I mean, I'm not sure Richard may know of the particular study, but this totally makes sense to me. Richard? Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. So if you survey seniors, and well, this has been done in Alberta, uh, the number one issue that comes up, you, you know, if you ask them, you know, what's the most important thing or what what's missing that would really help you? Managed, it actually turns out to be transportation. Mm -hmm. um, but when we think of transportation, we think, okay, we got to, you know, the town has to buy a handy bus and drive people, which actually many of them do, uh, or facilitate drive happiness, whom we work with at a provincial level to provide that transportation. But transportation is also walking. And uh, so things like snow and ice on sidewalks or parking lots. Uh, or not having ramps to walk up out of the parking lot into a store. So in other words, a, a curb, pretty hard to get up a curb if you have a walker or, or a, a wheelchair. Um, or if uh, you don't have sidewalks in the first place, all of that uh, plays a, a huge uh, role. Um, one of the definitions, so we sort of glossed over the fact that it's frail, older people who often end up in a hospital or a big chunk of them. One of the definitions of frailty is being dependent on someone. So if you can't, don't have ways of getting around, you become dependent on someone, somebody to take you shopping to appointments or to visit, or you can't or don't visit. So yet yeah, all of these things are really, really important. Um, and our Alberta winters don't help. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the next question is supporting locally is great, but when we have people living in poverty, buying locally is impossible impossible for them due to the cost. Have you engaged with those who live in poverty to figure out what their needs are? Um, I, I know a lot of communities have done that, and I maybe there are some people in the audience today that have had done some of this engagement in their communities. And that sort of is a sort of like the, the beauty of this is, you know, it's it's the brainstorming, okay, so what are the issues? What could we do? You know, how could we start to address this? Perhaps if there's somebody in the audience that has experienced this, they'd like to unmute and maybe share their experiences with the group. In the community of Westlock, we actually use WeCan 
We have We Can, which is a program that is set up and there's about 80 people that um, and anybody from the community can go and use it. And there is a little food box that is just of um, some meats. And then there's also one that is for vegetables and fruits. And um, I haven't personally tried it, but everybody that has that around me that has tried it said it's just very, very um uh, good value for your food. So they have a volunteer that goes to Edmonton and actually goes and picks up the food and brings it back. There's volunteers at one of our local churches and they actually put the food together on the, I think it's the third uh, uh, week of the month and you pay on the first week of the month and, and that's the way you get your food. So that's one of the ways of doing things. Very innovative. Thank you for sharing that. There's some other, um, a couple other things that uh, we weren't quite sure how much time we would have or what the questions would be. One of the things we sort of also gloss over a little bit is the importance of family caregivers. So just to slice and dice a different way, when we think of care and health care, we think of doctors, nurses, hospitals, family doctors, emergency departments, but actually 90% of care is provided in the community. And I'm talking care now, more in the medical sense. So if you think about it, actually two thirds of care is provided by family caregivers. So one elderly spouse to another spouse, a parent to a sick child, we all do it. We're all caregivers at some point, uh, an adult to an aging parent. Uh, so the biggest proportion of our care is provided that way. Now, the if you go back to this, you know, why are people, why do people end up in a hospital and do that list of diseases? One of the diseases that will pop up is heart failure. It's actually uh, by disease the most common reason for hospitalization in Alberta. But in heart failure, if you actually dig down, it's not the heart failure that leads to the hospitalization. The number one reason is actually urinary incontinence because we give them drugs that make them pee a lot. Number two reason is falls because we give them drugs that slow the heart rate and lower blood pressure. But reason number three is caregiver burnout. When people just can no longer cope, what do you do? Bring them to the hospital and guess what? You know, it's, I can't send them home. They're not coping at home. Remember that slide? So anything that can be done to help family caregivers, um, is can be, reap huge rewards. That means like, you know, give, we all know somebody who's a family caregiver. Do they need a break? Could you look after their loved one for an evening or an afternoon so they can just have a, a night off or an afternoon off uh, for themselves? Could you take them a meal? Could you drive their loved one, you know, to an appointment? Those are things that we can do at a, at a community level that can have a huge impact. And seeing as Westlock spoke up, uh, the mm -hmm. connecting people in communities for wellness or well-being in Westlock, which was a, an initiative to help people living with early dementia stay at home and in the community. First thing they did was look after the family caregivers. You know, the Legion sponsored dinner once a month for the family caregivers so they could get a night off, talk to each other, get some peer support. So that's one of the things that you know, we might want to think you might want to think of as well. And we know that one in four Albertans over the age of 15 is a family caregiver. So there are a lot of us out there. I think, was it Lucille that had her hand up? Yeah, I had a comment in terms of like when we talk about the social determinants of health and housing, it's um, like I'm from the north, like northern Alberta. In, the, in our community, like it's even a bigger issue in terms of even getting contractors to get building permits that will allow for multifamily uh, dwelling in specific zones that can take and I'm thinking of one contractor in specifically that is taken over three and possibly four years in order to work their progress through yeah. the county in order to get that and so you know it just th those little pieces um make a big impact on the whole community like why it's taking so long I don't know but um you know, it's not for a lack of trying sometimes. Sometimes it's just the the rules that um, municipalities, counties uh, follow. So that's just a comment. I, I, I've heard that lots, Lucille. I'm a, 
a surveyor with Accreditation Canada, and I was doing a survey in the Kootenays last spring. And in many of those communities, a lot of the rental accommodation uh, that was previously rental uh, was taken over by Airbnbs and, you know, that type of thing. And they there was no place for healthcare workers to, to live. So they were ending up having to fly uh, workers in from Newfoundland. So I think there have been some changes to the regulations that since since then, but you're right. I mean, that's where I think there needs to be some citizen lobbying to get those um, rules changed. That is exactly right. Uh, a good part of our home care team are from uh, the locum and the agency nurses, which cost thousands and thousands of dollars, and there's nowhere else for them to stay when yes. they come. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for the presentation. This has been uh, very, very interesting. I guess my comment is on actual home care. I live in Flatbush. I'm in a very rural community. And as far as having home care coming out of Westlock or Slave Lake, even I know we are with Westlock, but it's very, very difficult to get even wound care and that to come out to rural areas. So when you have your seniors to live in their own homes, it's very, very difficult if they have issues and need that home care with transportation and stuff. I find there there's a disconnect in there with getting the home care to come out because it's a lot cheaper to have home care come to their homes than to have this senior into a hospital. These yeah. are really important points, um, Sandra. And I know there are some um, um, forums that are being established by the Minister of Health um, in the coming weeks and months uh, to, um, you know, hear from people. Um, and so that it's important that your vote, that your concerns are shared. There's a series coming up for healthcare workers, but I think there will be others. Um, so absolutely critical to share your concerns. There's all sorts of innovative ideas as, as well. So despite the fact, and I know it, is, it applies just as much to rural as to urban, you know, around the ambulance crisis, um, you know, in some rural areas, you know, the paramedics are at, will have zero calls in a 24 hour period. So you've got this resource, you know, could there be things, could they be providing some of the wound care, for example, you know, that's just an example. Another one is, is uh, the use and training of community health workers. Um, we did this in, in Northwestern Saskatchewan or worked with that, whereby um, through the Battleford Tribal Council, so on reserve train, community health workers, just a couple of weeks of training, and they were able to manage a lot of the simple things. And they were supported by nurse practitioners who in turn were supported by the doctors. So you had this sort of cascading effect of, you know, people did what they could. And then if they didn't, they went to the next level, but everything didn't depend on, you know, a super duper highly trained professional that could be done some other way. Mm -hmm. Those are just examples and ideas that, you know, we collectively need to start thinking about. Even some of the virtual care options too, you know, in other jurisdictions and in Alberta, a lot of that is happening more readily. So that's really very helpful for people that are isolated or if transportation is a challenge. Good morning. Um, so I, I've had the uh, the benefit of living both urban and rural. I was a senior health care leader in Calgary for many, many years and have now retired uh, in the southwest, um, southwest portion of the province. I think I and I run in, I run into several things. I think we've talked already about the healthcare professional recruitment issue into smaller centers. First of all, we have to make it attractive for them. Secondly, that they have to have some place to live. And I think many many rural communities are facing the same thing you saw in the Kootenays, where there's just no place for people to live, um, so they are not willing to relocate or bring the family. But the other point I wanted to make is we talk about family caregivers and respite. The other thing I'm really seeing in our communities is volunteer fatigue. It seems to be the same people who step up um, as much as they can. Certainly the, the faith-based organizations do a tremendous amount in rural communities um, and so do some individuals. But I think in these times right now in Alberta where people are needing to go to work uh, in order to survive in the province due to the cost of housing and food and um, uh, you know, utilities, that they're no longer available to volunteer. Um, and we end up with this real volunteer fatigue where, you know, we could have, you know, elderly visitation groups, right? People to go out to the rural areas and visit, yeah. you know, on their farms and visit the elderly and, and help with some of that loneliness factor. There's just not enough people 
enough, you know, beating hearts out there um, to do that. And the other thing I see is a lot of the solutions that come um, and and I stay very connected with what's happening across the province in health. A lot of the the um, solutions it we're back to that representation by population and it makes sense right you know the larger the population that can be served with the with the resources that's what's going to happen so certainly the larger centers end up with a lot more um uh, innovative programs to help deal with some of these issues than than we do see in the rural communities and it's just because we have a small population to serve so if you can serve you know 100,000 people in Lethbridge or or whether you can serve 10,000 people in Cardston area, then you're certainly going to go for the bigger bang for the buck. So I think that, you know, everything you've said today, um, I think just rings so true. I think we're we're now, um, I used to teach skiing in my youth and I was very good at detection. I could tell you what you were doing wrong, but I couldn't correct very well. I didn't have a lot of solutions that were going to fit one size, but, you know, they'd be, that were fit, suitable for everyone. So we we certainly know the problems across the province and across the country. I'm just not sure we have solutions that are that are viable right now based on um, the economy, the population, um, et cetera. So I found your presentation extremely interesting. I just sort of think... Yeah, but how? How are we get like? How do we do this? Um, how do we rally a community where there are no people to be rallied to help out? So, just a comment more than a question. Thank you. Actually, yeah, total uh, makes sense, Barbara. And I think too that you know, in the past, maybe we've kind of as communities we've we've relied on the system to kind of solve the problem for us, right? And so I think that probably in the newer thinking is that it's actually the people that can figure out what the solutions are. So I know that there are huge challenges and, you know, on many different fronts, but I, hopefully this has given people a little bit of optimism that, um, you know, that you do have the solutions within you and that I think we need to reframe our thinking in the health system and, you know, and, you know, sort of, um, start listening more to communities because that's where truly where the where the wealth is. I see a comment here about T socials and I'm sure we can find some evidence to share with you on that. Um, but absolutely those kinds of things are really, really important. And Rebecca says that she was actually fortunate enough to be in the UK to learn about social prescribing in November. We know some other folks that were there too and um that um that, that was apparently was a great, uh, great opportunity. There's also a question around racism and LGBTQ2S community and their safety. And how does this play a role in community and rural settings and in their social determinants of health? Uh, absolutely. Very critical um, for people to feel safe. And um, again, I don't know if there's opportunity for the community to start addressing that and, and, uh, looking at, at um, uh, potential solutions? One of the, uh, I was just going to add, one of the, we didn't have time to go into it, but one of the ways in which we work, we sort of touched on it as well, is this, we, we try to use this asset-based community development approach, as do other eight, uh, groups in Alberta. So for example, we're very close with Healthy Aging Alberta, uh, and many of the actual towns and municipalities, uh, in fact, um, Alberta municipalities, uh, um, endorses this approach. City of Edmonton and now City of Calgary are all, and Red Deer are all uh, using this approach. And it is sort of identifying the community assets. But one of the underpinnings of asset based community development is it isn't us versus them. It's not us and those criminals, us and those old people, <laughs> you know, us and those unemployed. No, they are us. They are part of us. Uh, they're not separate. Um, you know, we're very good at, you know, okay, just take the elderly people, put them in the home, take the criminals, put them in a jail, you know, take these people, put them there, separate them up. But no, they, you know, they are us. So question arises, okay, so if they are part of us, how do we then look after them? And there's some really interesting stories where criminals have been totally rehabilitated by the community when they change the attitude of us versus them. And, you know, they are part of us. Why are they doing what they're doing? I know that's a little bit also sometimes Pollyanna and I realize the realities, but sometimes that attitude will uh, 
uh, can help us in uh, in that uh, that sphere. And I think most of the other comments in the Q and A were just more comments than anything. Um, I just want to thank you both for sharing and educating us more about the health systems integration team and the work that's been happening across the province. I personally learned a great deal and I'm hopeful that our members did too. Um, I believe that being a part of a healthy welcoming community that's attractive to new exi and existing healthcare providers is, is being a community that's engaged and vibrant and supporting wellness and doing all the things that's needed by all of the members, not just a select few. And so I thought your information definitely resonated with me. So I'm hoping that everybody enjoyed it as much as I did.